Welcome uh, to this session called Deep Listening, Deep Learning, Creating Space for Circle Dialogue. I'm really excited to see you all here. Lots of familiar faces, which uh, makes me feel comfortable and a little nervous. Um, but at the same time, we're just really glad uh, for this conference and to everybody who has been organizing this conference. It's been a great conference with a really great feel about it in terms of uh, deepening our understanding of the importance of relationships in teaching and learning. So um, I just want to um, you know, tell you how much we appreciate that you're here. I do want to begin with a land acknowledgement this morning again. And Noreen, at the beginning of yesterday's session, said how this practice actually comes from indigenous peoples from way back. And a few months ago, in conversation with Chief Missile Joe from Miyapakuk, uh, First Nation, he indicated clearly to me how the practice actually included a welcoming to the land by the people who, um, whose land it was, and then an acknowledgement by the visitors that they were actually on the land of those people. So um, to, um, to follow that practice, I'd like to actually invite you all to stand up for a moment. Okay? And um, I would like to um, acknowledge that this morning, when we swung our feet out of bed, we put them on the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, that neighbor on the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq, and that we also want to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original peoples of Labrador, another very important part of our province. And then we strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Just take a moment to reflect on that. Okay, you can have a seat. Thank you. This kind of acknowledgement is really important in cir circle dialogue as well, because it's always about acknowledging every one of us who are present, creating space for each other, creating space for deep listening, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and observance of how we are sharing space and time. So the purpose of this workshop today is to give you an overview of circle dialogue and what that entails, to hear the experiences of three students um, uh, who have been involved in circle dialogues in, in their class, and an opportunity to share what you are thinking and wondering about circle dialogue. So we're going to start off and we're going to actually invite you all to participate in a check-in circle. And we kind of looked at the number and the space and we were expecting a space where we could move tab tables and chairs. But taking, um, I always say, you know what, we are flexible with the space that we have and we make it happen. So. Um, we're going to start off with a check-in circle. Then I'm going to give you some background in, uh, as to what circle dialogue is very, very briefly. Then we're going to hear from the three students in terms of how that impacted who they were personally, professionally, and in terms of their learning. Um, and then after that, we're going to do another circle, a check out circle, where you're going to um, get to share what you are thinking at this point possibly a question, um, and how this might impact or apply to your particular settings. Now, um, I want to um, uh, just, I lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> we'll just let things unfold <laughs> and roll up as they are. Okay. So what I'd like to do is invite you all to just leave your pencils, papers, um, gadgets uh, at your table right now or at your desk. And I'd like you to come and just stand in a circle. And what we'll do, I think, is we'll start here and we'll uh, go around maybe the first bank or two of chairs as well. So just come on over, stand shoulder to shoulder. Um, Bukala, you can come in here, OK? And we'll see whether we can actually to these two people. Yes. 
check and book one. I'll give you mine. Okay, perfect. This is going to work. Okay. No matter what. No matter what. Well, maybe we'll spread out just a little bit here. I'd like to introduce you to um, three of my students, Bethany Pretty and Tina Sela, both of whom were in my uh, Relationships First Restorative Justice Master's class this past um, semester, and Bukula uh, Bulawade, did I say that right? Bulawade. Bulawade, who um, was in uh, a Relationships First class, I don't know, two summers ago, but then did her uh, thesis on um, restorative justice in a science high school class and the role of circle dialogue in a science high school class. Uh, very powerful work. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Bethany who's going to tell us about how we set up a circle. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> All right. So when we set up a circle, uh, there are a number of things that uh, we would like to do every time. Uh, what my job was, I guess, was to set up the center. Um, and our theme that we decided on was deep. So immediately I started thinking about deep sea, deep roots. So yesterday I went on a crazy excursion and I had hail and snow and wind and, and I met the same two elderly people on two different beaches. I swear it was really strange. Um, but anyway, so the centerpiece is uh, a lot of things that have washed up on the shore from the deep sea and the root of the tree is what I was kind of putting in the center. So I kind of like to make it all a little presentation. And you could probably smell the sea air, mm -hmm. which is something I wanted to try to do. So the circle also has some guidelines um, that allow the participants in the circle to honor one another. And so three of some of those generic guidelines are that you are free to pass if you have nothing to share, um, that you speak from the heart, and that one person speaks at a time, and it's the person who holds the talking piece. And we'll share that with you in just a few moments. Um, and so the centerpiece is set up as um, a focal point, okay? Um, often to uh, be a thread to pull through the theme of that class or that presentation, okay? The guidelines, you, what you'll experience in a few moments is what, um, how a circle can build relationship quickly. Go ahead, Bukala. And when we are sharing, we use what we call the talking piece. And uh, I chose this, this a speaker, huh? Because usually when you're talking about listening, we're talking about learning, it has to do with somebody talking and other listening. So I chose this as a speaker. So what we usually do is we pass as you have a question. So you pass it. If you have something to say, you, you say mm -hmm. on. It's only the person that is holding the talking piece that can talk. All other people listen. So it's one of the good practice of the circle. So this morning, we continue, we have a check-in question, and I'm going to use this, I just pass it around. You can make it clockwise or anti-clockwise. So for this morning, I'll make it clockwise, so it goes this way. So, and the questions that I have for you this morning is number one, you just introduce yourself, your name, then the question will be, since we have the C uh, object as a, a centerpiece, if you are to be a C animal, what will it be? <laughs> <laughs> one word. <laughs> just one word. Yeah. So just think about what you'll be. If you, want, if you are going to be a sea animal, what will it be? So I start from here. Oh, think. think time. Okay. Just take a, a moment to think. Then I'll pass it. <coughs> I think I can pass now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could we all use the microphone to yeah. ensure accessibility oh. for those who are hard of hearing? Okay. Yeah, that's you. a good idea. So we'll move. <laughs> so we move. If you have, if you are to be a sea animal, what are you going to be? So two words, your name okay. and the sea animal. Yeah. But you can pass if you want to. 
Okay, my name is Oi. I want to be a whale. <laughs> my name is Michelle, and I'm going to use my imagination here, and I want to be a mermaid. <laughs> my name is Brian, and I want to be a blue crab. Uh, my name is Dan, and I'd like to be a dolphin because they seem to enjoy life and have fun. I'm Shannon the Walrus. <laughs> I'm Jason, and I'd be a shark. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Beth Ann, I'd be a starfish. I'm Robin, I'd be a sea turtle. Um, Amy, I'm Amy, a brittle star. I'm Jana. I want to be a manta ray. Ooh. I'm Elsa. I'd like to be an octopus. Natasha, I'm going to go with seal. Mm. And I'm Karen, and I want to be a seal too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Helen, and I want to be, if I have to choose, a dolphin. Mm. Lisa, and I would be an angelfish. Erica, definitely an octopus. <laughs> Wanda and a dolphin as well. I'm Joel, and I would love to be one of those deep sea fishes that has the phosphorescent <laughs> proboscis. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ed, lobster. I am Donna, uh, octopus. Janet, and I have to go with turtle. I'm Aditi, and uh, I want to be Ariel the mermaid. <laughs> I'm Charlotte, and I would be a starfish. I'm Claire, and I'm going to go with Stingray. Mm. <laughs> I'm Amy, and I would be a dolphin as well. I'm Heather, and I'll go with Seahorse. And nobody got one. Make sure I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, dolphin. Hi, I'm Kathy, and I will be a sea urchin. I'm Heather, and I would like to be a sockeye salmon. The other BC person. I'm Jennifer, and I'd like to be an otter. Mm. I'm Bethany, and I have to join Team Dolphin. <laughs> oh. I'm Tina, and I'd be a starfish. Oh, where's the speaker? Oh, I got it. Okay. My hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm talking to you. Um, I would be a starfish. I'll be a tilapia fish. Mm. Tilapia. Okay. You want to just put it in this talking piece in a circle? Yeah. Okay, so um, we start off with a quick check-in circle, something light that we don't have to think about <coughs> too much. But what do you notice um, based on what you've heard from the people in this group so far? Just let's call out one or two or three things. What strikes you? Humor. 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 Creative. Creativity. Everybody participated. Yeah. Everybody's voice was heard and every person was acknowledged in that way. Um, when we do this, and I, and I um, teach this in particular for K through 12, but also at the university level, what we find at break times is that people who said dolphins will gravitate towards each other. <laughs> people who said, you know, um, you know a, a stingray, if there was only one, somebody might go to that person and talk to them. It somehow breaks down barriers in really incredible ways, whether you're four years old or whether you're 36 years old. Okay, so. I'll invite you to go back to your seat and we'll talk about where this is coming from and what this is all about. <laughs> and I just want to point out that this never happens. Um, we're actually right on time. So <laughs> I'm really glad about that. So. Um, so what's happening or what happens in circle dialogue? How do we go to deep listening and deep learning? And we've just done something very light, but that very light um, uh, beginning is really important for um, the beginning of developing relationship. 
uh, in the classroom. And so I am really excited about um, how this dovetails well, uh, Brian, to your talk yesterday morning, um, where we where there was just this real incredible emphasis on relationship. And um, Brian said, inclusion is predicated on the relationship I develop in the classroom. And that is totally resonates with circle dialogue. And um, one of the things, uh, like Brian, you were talking about large classes. Um, often I am privileged not to have to teach great big classes, but classes up to about 35. And so we are able to actually stand in circle and so on. But what I want to share with you right now is that, yes, physically, it's really important to stand or sit in circle if you can. But if you can't, you use those same concepts to think about, how, about your larger classes, okay? Um, so, um, Brian said, it's, inclusion is predicated on the relationship I develop in the classroom. And I would expand that to say, the relationship I develop as the instructor, but that the space I create for the students to um, understand their relationship and develop relationship. And so it is all about understanding the context of where you are, understanding your own blind spots as the instructor, where is your privilege getting in the way? And then um, getting to know your students. And it is really interesting how much I learn as the instructor through those very simple check-in circles. You know, there's a lightness that, that rehumanizes my students and it draws me out of thinking only about the content. So it's actually all about what we talk about as relationships first. And many of you here know that we have a relationships first consortium that's housed in the Faculty of Education that is all about this stuff. So ultimately, it's about um, belonging. Is it about belonging? Is it about fitting in? Often, we're happy if we feel like the students are fitting in. But fitting in, um, as Brené Brown says, is far different than belonging. And belonging is what we're aiming for. How do we create spaces of belonging? So what's at the root of all of this? Um, much of my work has been in restorative justice education. And circle dialogue is one of the practices of restorative justice education. And so there was a real emphasis on developing relationships. And then I kept saying in my doctoral work, well, why are relationships so important? Like we're making an assumption that relationships are important. So can we be explicit about why relationships are important? And so what we started to look at were the worldviews, the philosophical frameworks of what's at the root of some of these very simple relational processes. And that is that there's this seed. There's this, if you can imagine you're holding on to a seed, what is the seed of circle dialogue? It has to do with the fact that we see all human beings doesn't matter what they look like, what they sound like, what they've done in the past, what they will do in the future. Every single human being is worthy. Okay? Every single human being thrives in relationship. For some of us who are introverts, the one, you know, a one or two people is, an, is enough. Those of us who are extroverts, it's, you know, huge masses that we need for that relationship. But ultimately, without relationship, we cannot thrive. And that basically then we say, our well-being is nurtured by one another. That's the seed. That's the root. That's what's at the bottom of thinking about relationship and the importance of belonging in our teaching and learning, regardless of what level we're teaching at. So it really, what it is, is acknowledging that our current society does not honor people as worthy and relational. It's about saying that the individual is important, success is important, and that I do whatever I can to get ahead. 
Okay? That's a real North American way. And we're moving what we, and I see this in, in so much work nowadays, is how do we live an interconnected lifestyle? And I believe our indigenous peoples of this land are actually going to lead us and show us what that's really about. Okay, so we have uh, some key values uh, for a Circle Dialogue, and that is respect, dignity, and mutual concern. And where respect is, how do we look again from the other person's perspective? Dignity comes from Kant, where worth that has no substitute. So if any one of you left this room and then and somebody else came to fill in your chair, that person does not replace you. And finally, that there's this reciprocal caring that develops for one another. And each one of these things could be unpacked. Ultimately, um, it's about how we view each other. And I forgot my glasses today. Um, but um, it's about taking off lenses where we measure each other or judge each other based on what we look like, sound like, what kind of marks we get or don't get, and replacing them with lenses that honor. How do we put on a way of looking at our students where we actually honor each of them? And I ask myself as an instructor all the time, am I measuring, am I honoring, what message am I sending my students? What message am I sending you? Okay, um, so you see the seed there, okay? Uh, people are worthy and interconnected, and that impacts all my relationships, beginning with myself. And if my relationship with myself is not healthy, then any of these other relationships will suffer as a result of that, okay? And then ultimately, it's our relationship with our environment. I'm gonna speed ahead here, I, okay? In education, then, here's that seed again. When we think about our classrooms uh, and our, our subjects that we're teaching, are we creating just and equitable learning environments? Is the curriculum, curriculum that truly honors the content and the people involved in that content? Are we nurturing healthy relationships? And then when things don't go quite the way they're supposed to, do we actually embrace those things rather than run from them, okay? And so ultimately there's three components for, and circle dialogue deepens that. I'm going to skip through this. So there's all kinds of circles, check-in circles, check-up circles, check-out circles, curriculum circles, problem-solving circles, healing circles. Really what it is about, it's about a way of thinking. How can we create space and time for every human being that we are in contact with? So it's about deep, radical listening. We think about three kinds of listening. It's not about interruptive listening, where we're thinking about what we want to say while other people are talking. It's not cataphatic listening or compassionate listening, where we're just we're, we're sitting with somebody who's, who's grappling with something, and we're just a sounding board for them. But deep listening, and the word is apophatic listening, is listening with the realization that I might need to change. And the I there in this context is that I, the teacher, the instructor, the professor, might need to change. And how can I work with my students so that they learn this deep listening? that they're not afraid of changing their perspectives and their views of the world, okay? So deep, learn, deep listening is required for deep learning, okay? Um, I'm, I'm gonna pass over this one. And um, I have this slide up here as I invite Bethany and uh, Tina and Bukala to come up, uh, maybe one at a time to just share their experiences of what it was like to be in a course where the whole course was run in circle. Okay, uh, Bethany, you want to start? Yeah. Hello? Okay. Hi, I'm Bethany again. 
Uh, so uh, we were asked to concentrate on kind of three topic areas that um, we learned in the course. So listening, learning, and our relationships. And in terms of listening, I know you don't know me, but uh, <laughs> I find it very hard, I realize, to be an active listener because I'm always wanting to, like, you say something, oh I, oh, I did that too, or I want to say that too. So I found in a talking circle with the talking piece, uh, I really learned how to calm down and actually stop and listen to what other people were saying. So in a way, I think, I mean, I teach elementary and intermediate and secondary, but all of my students, I can kind of recognize myself in them because I know that there are kids in my class that want to go, oh, me, 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 me. So for me learning it, it was really powerful for me to be like, okay, I definitely can see the perspective of my student. Uh, another thing in terms of listening, um, when I grew up teaching, the teacher was in front of everybody and pointing and, you know, that's a thing of the past. I think it's important to have opportunities for students to be talking just as much. I don't want to be the teacher that is constantly lecturing. It's, I want to make opportunities where kids are talking to each other and collaborating with each other. So listening to each other, not just the teacher. In terms of learning, um, it was my f this is my first semester as a graduate student. And I felt it was so powerful to see other people coming together as professionals and learning about this way of thinking and, way and perspective, the way of thinking about different perspectives. So I think maybe everybody should do restorative justice in education, just saying. <laughs> um, but I think, and just the fact that as teachers, we're lifelong learners all the time. And it's great to have an open heart and an open mind when you're, you're learning wonderful things like this. Um, and it's a reminder of how complicated and essential relationships are and how different relationships have ripples. That's what it's all about, relationships first. So you might not see the immediate reaction or the, medi the immediate ripple of what's happening in your classroom with that child, but they have so many relationships behind them. And it's good to remind yourself, like, it's not just that person that's in your classroom. They're connected in so many ways with the community, with the school, with their friends. And that's all great to kind of remember that that's important to respect and honor them. And in terms of relationships personally, uh, I just returned home from working in China. I'm basically an international teacher. I don't have a lot of teaching experience in Newfoundland. And I'm coming back and I'm living with my mother again. So in terms of relationships, <laughs> I'm 38, it's really happening. Um, my mother and I are best friends, but we just clash. It's like two fireworks in a, in a pail. And I've, honest to God, I'd go home after Dorothy's class, and I would reflect on the words and the language and everything that we talked about in class. And it really opened up dialogue with my mom. And the, you're going to laugh at this. Yesterday, she said to me, because I was saying, oh, I'm going to have, I have to be a part of a presentation. And she said, I got to tell you something. I'm like, okay. I went in your room. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I found your relationship's first textbook. And I started reading about it. <laughs> because she, because she, you know, she heard me talk about it. But I thought it was really, you know, she's never been to university. She's never been to, tr like, she's been to trade school. But I thought it was really cool that she wanted to learn more about it because I think that deep down she recognizes that it, it's actually affected our relationship. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, and one last thing. Uh, I recently subbed, I think two days ago, in a school. And it has affected my teaching relationship because I immediately got a chair and I put it right in the front of the class. And I let them come to me because, you know, is this who has substitute teach and taught here? A couple people. It's impossibly hard. So I put this, I, I automatically did it. I put the chair in the center and they all started to come to me. I mean, you're not going to make a circle in the first day of teaching strange strangers. But it was really, really cool. And I realized and I recognized the power of kind of that circle and having a center and 
kind of getting down at the level and everybody being involved. And that's my experience. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I thought I could share um, a little bit of a different perspective about what it's like to be in a talking circle um, in our class, um, not as so much as the participant, but as the facilitator. So these are just some of my reflections about my, my learning from that. Um, and so I'll, I'll specifically speak in terms of um, what I learned about listening, listening deeply, and relationships and also some of the challenges that I had. And really one of the main challenges was learning to listen and be fully present in the discussion, yet managing the time effectively and incorporating still all the major components of the circle and the material that we had prepared ahead of time. And it's in this process that we learn about how to provide structure to the circle yet also to still value all those who are in the circle. And as I listen to the contributions of those in the circle, I realize that I must gauge when to move the conversation into the next part of the agenda that we had prepared without dismissing anyone's feelings. And that being said, if I need to redirect the discussion, I need to do it in an empathetic and constructive manner. I also think that what is needed under such circumstances is not only clearly articulating our intentions and using examples from the beginning, but also being attentive to the way in which the message is received. So really ensuring that what we're trying to convey is understood by all those in the circle. Another major learning point for me from the experience was what it means to understand each other through each other. And that was um, something that we took away from one of the articles that we looked at in the class. And to me, part of this process of understanding each other through each other um, entails learning what each person needs in order to be at their best. And guarding this need at the forefront of our minds as we contribute to circle discussions. And in order to be attentive to what others need to be at their best, I think the facilitator needs to val validate each person's contribution to the circle, but cannot and certainly and avoids controlling and disciplining um, the responses and the direction of the circle. So there's th this element of a natural flow, I think, to the, to the discussion. And reflecting on all this, I appreciate how the relationships first approach that is emphasized um, in our course and also specifically in the circle is what motivates me to listen to the contributions of the individuals in the circle and then give myself the opportunity to value and to digest the often intimate information that they just shared. Because as it's a confidential space, often things that people share are quite intimate and from the heart. I would then reflect briefly after listening to the contributions of others and share my perspectives, but also be content with silence that often occurs in between because again, these are things that people are sharing that can be very intimate and um, require reflections from others and before they share what they, what they feel and what they are considering. So whether as a facilitator or simply a participant in the circle, I recognize a responsibility that I have. And that is that as members of a circle and of a community, we are interconnected and we are intertwined. And so I must recognize that my actions and my gestures have an effect that is often more profound than I think on the group with which I'm interacting. So those are my reflections for you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to say the hymn part of Saku Dialogue for me, uh, first and foremost, because of my different background, it really assisted me to get to the point I am presently. And through the Saku practice, I was able to experience 
uh, what is called the inclusion education. Because as an international student, I remember I have done almost five courses before I took this course. And I want to say that the real experience of inclusion was found in this particular class. Because with international students' experience, it's a bit different from the local students. There are a lot of challenges, uh, known and unknown, that uh, we go through. And we are still filled with this academic rigor. But I want to say with the practice of SACO, I was able to you know, go through this transition more smoother, you know, and uh, I was, I, the, the sense of belonging, I was able to realize myself, accept my identity, who I am, uh, which have a little bit been injured in some ways, but thinking about relationship, it really revived me. It was a healing process for me to continue in the thesis route that I took when I was on campus. So I want to say that with uh, the circle accommodating me was the, the, the beginning of the success that I have now. So it really impacted me, and that was the courage I received to do the thesis I did. Because going to high school to, as an international student to embark on a project was really challenging. Now to get the attention of the teacher, get the attention of the student, it took a lot. But because of the support, social support, emotional support, the academic support to take accountability for my study through the circle processes, you know, the seed, that seed kept going on with me. And that is what I'm still working with at present. I was able to go through that, my thesis. I remember there are some of my other colleagues that, as international students, that wanted to go on thesis route, but because they couldn't get somebody that we understand them, in fact, some started, they couldn't continue because we need this support as international students, inclusion, to know that we are different. You know, you know to, as a, a one of our a, a speaker was saying yesterday, you know, you teach, many a times instructors deal with the subject, not the person. But with this participating in the, the circle, I discovered that my personality was touched, you know, the, you know I, I felt at home. I felt, yes, this is what I wanted. And I've been taught for more than, I think I have, I've taught for 20 years before coming to Canada with experience of uh, academic experience, teaching experience, administrative experience. I have not had this kind of experience of SACO, which will make me to really, you know, accept my students as they are, you know like that. But with this experience, it was like I needed a space to be able to carry the same experience somewhere. And that was why I went into that research. And it was really fascinating because the students were able to have enough time to process, you know, their learning through the circle because, you know, students are different. By the time one can give an answer quickly, another will need a little more time. Circle process gave that opportunity. And uh, it really helped me. Now I'm out of school. I'm still working as early childhood educator because I want to see how that works with that because I've had that experience before. So I want to see how I can you know, influence the life of these young ones as you grow with this. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate my supervisor. She has been a, an heroine to me <laughs> and uh, an encouragement to keep on. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> There's nothing like the voice of experience. Right? Um, and one thing that didn't come out real clearly in the stories that I'd like to add is that in the circle dialogue, I often have a mix of, of students, national, international. And then we always have, it, they're usually three hour classes. And we have break time and we bring food. Food is important. Food is really, really important. But what I had experienced in the past was I would see the international students kind of on their own and a couple of them kind of wandering off and then the local students um, somewhere else having good conversations. But through Circle Dialogue, every break time, it was like they were just all together because they had heard from each other and it was a beautiful thing. 
I'm, we've got one minute, and we were going to end with a circle. So either we can agree to go for another six minutes, or we can end. Do you want to, are we okay to do a quick circle? And if any of you have to leave, thank you very much. And there is, um, if you just look up Relationships First Newfoundland Labrador, you'll find lots of resources and stuff. But why don't you just come around quickly? Mm -hmm. And what time is the break from? Uh, right now to 11. Oh, it's just till 11. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let's just stand in a circle quickly. <laughs> and maybe what we'll do is we'll take a couple of uh, questions. Um, our original plan was, and as you're coming up, what are you thinking? How does this apply to your situation? Well, most people are sticking around, okay. So just uh, um, feel free to pass, <laughs> and, um, but just keep it just really short so we can get a tidbit of how 45 minutes impact.